So we've counted down 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Now, before we get to the top three, now those top three took a lot of deliberation for me to actually get them into that top three. But there's, uh, there's hundreds of cichlid species, in my opinion, that could have made this list. Hundreds, and I'm not joking, hundreds. However, I gotta put a few down to some serious honorable mentions. I think I narrowed it down to four. <laughs> so we're not gonna go into big detail about them as much, but uh, the four in question, now you guys heard me tell the story about the umbies, that was a, that number four. Well, that umby, I had that pair for, for years, years and years and years. I grew them up, they produced tons and tons of fry. It is still, to this day, without question, the most profitable fish that I have ever kept and bred at the time because nobody else had them. I was literally the only one that had them. And I know now they're from all sorts of different regions and I know they're plentiful in the trade if people want to get them and they're relatively inexpensive. But back then, they were not available anywhere. I was selling them through the ACA trading post, dating myself here, but uh, you know, every single month they were going. And then eventually, I think the male uh, killed the female. Yes, the male killed the female. And I had this gigantic male that I kept for years. And uh, without a word of a lie, when he was full size for me, he only fit diagonally in a dolphin box. He was 32 inches from the tip of his nose to the end of his caudal. Not his caudal peduncle, but the end of his caudal fin. Uh, that is not normally used for measurements for, for, for scientific purposes, but I just know that the size of a dolphin box was 30 inches long and he had to fit diagonally in that box. Now you guys are wondering why Biggs is putting this fish in a box. He's not shipping that fish, that's insane. Well, that's exactly what happened. Uh, after the male killed the female, I kept him as a pet and I would have kept him for his entire life. However, this was right around I'm gonna say it was 91, 91 or 92. It was right after that book came out because everything happened really, really fast. And uh, there was an ACA in Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. I think it was 1992. And at that convention, there was a few things of note. At that particular convention, I saw for the first time ever that beautiful Crenicicla Shingu 1, I think it is, the beautiful orange pike. It was called the orange French fry at the time. Just a blaze orange pike, the diminutive. But when it gets bigger, it kind of loses that color and turns into kind of a red sausage pike. Still beautiful, but not that blaze orange. Uh, and then another thing of note was that most of the Victorian cichlids, when that rage just started, started at that convention. I remember seeing some of the very first pairs of uh, haplochromus at the time, obliquidins and stuff like that, going for hundreds of dollars at the auction. Just <laughs> Next year, they're going for a dollar, but this year they're going for 300 because they were just the hot new fish. And the other thing of very, very much of note was that Dr. Paul Loisel introduced the world, uh, or at least the cichlid world in the convention site, uh, to Madagascar cichlids. And he brought with him pairs of, well, at the time, Paratilapia, um, wasn't Bleakeri at the time, it was Polonai. Paratilapia Polonai had the very, very fine, small spots. And that's the first time that, as far as I knew, that anybody had ever seen that fish before. And they went for hundreds of dollars. And they weren't fry. They were like pairs the size of my hand. They were big. And I was like, you know, I, you know, I'm nine hours away from home. There's no way I'm buying any of these things at all. Now, fast forward, why am I telling you that long-winded story? Fast forward a little bit. Out of the blue, I get contacted by an individual through the Trading Post, which is the publication of the American Cichlid Association. At the time, there was no internet. And he really, really, really wants to buy umbies. And I told him the situation that I'd lost the female. I don't have any more umbies. And he wanted to buy the male. I said, I have no way of shipping the male how big it is. There's just no way it's going to make it. And he basically made me an offer I couldn't refuse. However, the deal was, is he had to send me stuff first because I did not trust him and I did not believe him that he could pull it through. And basically the deal was, is he was going to be sending me a small group of Santana Perca Damon, a beautiful earth eater from South America, a fish that I'd worked with a few times and it was very challenging to keep. 
Uh, and then the other thing he was going to be sending me was a group of Paratalapia polonii. The fish that just got introduced, I'm not talking, like a month or two ago at the ACA convention. I'm like, there's no way, whatever. You know, a lot of people want to pretend they have the new fish on the internet today and they want to talk all this stuff. But like back then, you either had it or you didn't. <laughs> but, you know, you fast forward a couple of weeks, back then we could air freight stuff to each other without question. And I went to pick up a box. And in that box, I had eight Santana, De uh, Santana Perca de Mon, Little Earth Eater. And I had six pair tilapia polonii, and they were very, very obvious what they were. And they were the fine spotted one, not the one that you commonly see now that is mostly uh, bleaker eye. And again, I'm not a Madagascar guy, so don't, don't jump on me for in the comment section for not knowing the nomenclature on it. But pair tilapia polonii at the time, we'll call it bleaker eye if that's its name, was a very, very unique fish. And I grew up, I grew, grew those up and spawned them. And they spawned exactly the way Paul says. They spawn in these little strings of eggs and they lay them on the driftwood and stuff. Absolutely fascinating primitive behavior. So that one definitely goes in my list of honorable mentions. The other two species won't have that long-winded story. But uh, Vieja melanurus, specifically the one that everybody knows as Sinspilum, the Quetzal cichlid. Absolutely treasured and beloved. I absolutely love my water cows and that's what I call all members of this grouping, those giant cumbersome lumpy fish that can go through the tank they can take the abuse of the aggressive fish and they can you know they're not overly aggressive they're mostly herbivorous absolutely love since spilum hypsorops nicaraguensis the the nicaraguan cichlid this fish honestly was in my list and i think it still should be in my list if i could do like a top 11 <laughs> that's a top 10 so it is what it is I absolutely love the fascinating behaviors of this fish. The way that the male's head is shaped is structured and is designed in a way for it to be a corkscrew in the soft silt uh, in the sides of the riverbank and the lakes where it inhabits. Uh, uh, Willem Hines in his videos uh, of studying the lakes in Nicaragua has, I, I encourage you to reach out to Willem Hines if you need, I'll put the link in the, in the description. Uh, the video showcases some of the most fascinating behavior in cichlids I've ever seen before. And it's well documented now, but he was the first one to get it on video about them basically babysitting dovi, a massive predator, babysitting their offspring so the parents can go and hunt. But Nicaraguensis is also a little trivia fact is the only cichlid known to have non-adhesive eggs. And what it does is it lays, it burrows these giant tunnels into the, into the sides of the lakes and the rivers and makes a nuptial chamber. And then the pair go in there and spawn. And because there's nothing actual solid to spawn on, no rocks, no nothing, uh, they actually just lay eggs and they fertilize them and they just agitate them so they kind of move around within that chamber. And it's just an evolutionary trait that this species has developed. But they are absolutely breathtaking in color and stunning to see. And the last one for my honorable mentions to round up this video is without question the one that has the best name of all cichlids in the world. And it's a fascinating fish as well because it's a biparental mouth brooder. It's a, it's a fairly primitive for a new world cichlid in regards to some of its, uh, its habits and stuff. It comes from Peru and it's called the Inca stonefish. Now you think that's impressive? No, its real name is Tuantin Soyua Makinsatsa, and it's named in honor of the area. But uh, that is an absolute fascinating fish with an absolutely incredible name. So it rounds up my honorable mentions. Now the problem with the honorable mentions is really <laughs> Most cichlids could fit into that honorable mention category. Well, maybe not discus. They're not really a cichlid, are they? They shouldn't be. Boring discus. I'm just kidding. But honestly, almost every cichlid I've kept, every single cichlid I've kept, be it it's a shell dweller from Lake Tanganyika, it's a West African, a Victorian, one of these weird new crater lake species, weird little dwarf pike cichlids from South America, Pistos, it doesn't really matter, all the way up to the big bruisers. Every single cichlid I have ever kept has something really cool and unique about it. Cichlids are truly fascinating. They are without question one of my absolute favorite families of fishes. There's a reason they've been with me for 40 plus years. Absolutely love them. So, with the honorable mentions, hope you guys enjoyed that. Next video. <laughs> I keep prolonging it, but next video, we're getting down and dirty with the top three. So until then, my friends, take care.